your Bibles to John chapter 10 and meet me at verse 10, John chapter 10 and verse 10. Over the last several weeks, we've been in this passage of scripture and the Lord Jesus says to us in verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it, life, more abundantly. And over the last several weeks, we've been talking about this verse because this is the verse that the Lord gave me when we started True Life Fellowship Church back in 2011. He said, I want my people to experience abundant life. I want my people to experience true life here on the earth. And Jesus didn't come to give us a religion. Jesus came to build a community a government, a kingdom of people that would be an example to the world of what it is to be a citizen and a son and daughter of the kingdom of heaven. And so he wanted us to experience true life, to have abundant life. And the enemy, the thief, is the one that is stealing, killing, and destroying. Anytime you see any type of stealing, any type of killing, or any type of destruction, I want you to attribute that to the thief. And the thief is the devil. He's the one that is taking. And if we are not experiencing this abundant life that Jesus came for us to have right here on the earth, then somehow, some way, the thief is stealing from us. Somehow, some way, the thief is killing, and somehow, some way, the thief is destroying. And so we have to understand Jesus came to give us abundant life to the full until it overflows and the thief is stealing it from us. And last week we talked about embracing abundance and the word abundance means above, beyond what's regular, extraordinary, excessive, bountiful, plentiful, overflowing, and cup runs over. This is the type of life Jesus intended for us to live here on the earth. It's a life that we would enjoy life. Now, most of us either are experiencing or we know someone not experiencing this life that Jesus called for us to live. Uh, if, we, if we're honest, we're like, I am not experiencing this abundant life. I'm not enjoying life. I'm not experiencing excess and overflow and surplus. I'm not experiencing that. And I want to submit to you, it's because the thief, has been stealing it from you. The thief has been killing your dreams and your vision, and the thief has been destroying your relationships through suggestion. That's his greatest weapon, to suggest that, hey, maybe this is not for you. Maybe this is for pastor, but not for you. Maybe this is for this person over here and not for you. Or he's just been using offense. You get offended at the word. You get offended at me as a pastor preaching abundance. You get offended and you cut yourself off from what God has for you. But somebody say, God wants me to enjoy this life. And so it is important that we understand in the Amplified Version, John chapter 10, verse 10, in the Amplified Translation, it says the thief comes only, he's got one purpose, only in order to steal, kill, and destroy I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Somebody say overflow. Overflow. In the the Passion Translation, John chapter 10, verse 10, in the Passion Translation says it this way, a thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, Life in its fullness until you overflow. Somebody shout overflow. Overflow. Now today is what I, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about overflow today. And I looked up the word overflow and it refers to a situation where an individual business or organization experiences a surplus beyond what is necessary for basic needs or planned expenses. It typically implies having more coming in than going out, leading to abundance. More coming in 
than going out leading to abundance. And I like this. It's a surplus beyond basic necessary needs. God desires through Christ Jesus and the salvation process for each and every one of us to experience overflow, to experience abundance. If we take a look at the Israelites who were in bondage to Egypt for over 400 years, they lived in a land and a time of not enough. They didn't have enough straw. They didn't have enough material. And their, their, uh, their slave masters were, in, while they were in bondage, was cracking the whip on them because they didn't have enough and they wouldn't supply enough. And so the Israelites were in a land of not enough. How many of you have ever been in the land of not enough? How many of you are currently in the land of not enough? Come on, somebody, be honest. Not enough. Well, then God took them to the land of just enough. The goal was for him to always bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. The goal was to always to take them to a land of abundance, of overflow and surplus. That was the goal. But he took them through the land of just enough in the wilderness. The purpose for him going, taking them through the wilderness was to get Egypt out of them. To, listen, he delivered them out of Egypt but he needed to get Egypt out of them. He needed to get their mindset shifted. He needed to get the, their perspective changed. He needed to get their ways of thinking changed so he couldn't take them from a land of not enough to the land of abundance. He had to bring them through the wilderness to the land of just enough. And if you remember in the land of just enough, they had just enough to eat for that day. The quail would come and you have to gather it just for that day, if you tried to keep it and save it, it would spoil and turn to worms and, and be nasty and all that good stuff. The manna was just enough. And they went through this land for 40 years of a land of just enough. But the goal was always to get them into the land of more than enough, to get them to the land of plentiful, of overflow, of surplus. And I declare for those of you to receive it, we are in the land of more than enough. Amen. We are in the land of surplus. Amen. We are in the land of overflow. Amen. We're in the land of more than enough. And God wants to move you from the land of being in need to the place where you give no thought to your needs. Are you listening to me? God wants to move you from the place where you're in need to the place where you don't even give thought to a need. He even says, Paul tells us in Philippians, right? God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. So he doesn't even want us considering our needs. Now we've just entered into the land of abundance and the land of more enough where we're not even thinking about our needs. Now we're thinking about helping somebody else in their need. What do I do with the extra? I help someone else in their need because God has taken care of my need. Come on, somebody says, amen. amen. And as long as the devil can keep you in the land of just enough, then you will not consider the overflow that God has for you. If you're comfortable with just enough, you won't consider abundance. Sometimes I hear people say this, and I know they mean well. They'll say things like, all I need is to make X amount of money. Let's say it's $100,000. I just need to make $100,000, take care of my four, and no more, and I'll live a comfortable life. That thought is from the devil. You want to have more so that you can be a blessing and to take care of somebody else, to help somebody else. What do I do with all the extra? I help somebody else with it. And so we need to start thinking abundance. We need to start thinking overflow. We need to start thinking more than enough. We need to start thinking surplus because this is the will of God for you. Somebody shout amen. amen. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse eight. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse eight. Watch this. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Now notice all of the absolute words in this passage of scripture. God is able to make all, that's an absolute word, 
all grace, all kindness and favor abound toward you, that you always, another absolute word, having all, uh, absolute word, sufficiency, in all things, there's not one thing that you won't have all sufficiency in, so that you may have an abundance, not just for one work, but for every good work. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. God is able means that you always have access to excess. Listen to me now. God being able means that you always have access to excess. And it is God's will that you have access to his excess. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse eight in the passion translate. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse eight in the passion. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough of everything. Glory to God. Every moment and in every way, he will make you overflow. Somebody shout overflow. Overflow. Shout overflow. Overflow. Shout it louder. Overflow. Overflow. With abundance in every good thing that you do. This is the word of God that he wants you to have overflow. He wants you to have abundance. He wants you to have sufficiency so that you can have in every area of your life and you got so much more that you have to give it away. You have to be a blessing. You have to find someone in need and share because you've got too much of the overflow happening in your life. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. Listen to this. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And every time you see the word overflow, I want you to shout overflow. You ready? All right. I pray that your love will more and more. Glory to God and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Notice Paul tells us that he is praying that our love will overflow. And so... I know you're operating and people get on your nerves. I know you're going around and your boss and your spouse and your children and your parents or your or your or your sons and daughters or whatever the case may be. I know they're getting on your nerves and I know that people cut you off in traffic and I know people say things to you. And I know that you are feeling like my love tank is low. But the scripture tells us here that our love tank is overflowing that you will begin to operate with an overflow of patience and kindness. Now, love is built on two pillars, patience and kindness. We can define love, really, with these two words, patience and kindness. Patience is how love reacts. Kindness is how love acts. Patience is, I like to use it this way, patience is like your defense. I'm going to react with patience. I'm going to be slow to anger. And kindness, the other side of love, is the action where I'm looking for ways to be kind. I'm looking for ways to be generous. I'm looking for ways to tell you I love you. I'm looking for ways to demonstrate and show that I love you. And on these two pillars, patience and kindness, we are attacked on both sides. Uh, On on the patient side, people are trying our patience. But the word here says that we are overflowing with love more and more. Matter of fact, release your faith. Say, I am overflowing overflowing with love love. more and more. more. And when you endeavor to be kind, I want you to factor this in, okay? When you endeavor to be kind, go ahead and factor in that someone's going to take advantage of you. Just factor it in. Someone is going to take advantage of me. I remember a particular time we had started the church, and we have a fund, um, you know, at the church that we like to help people. This is why it's important to be a member of a church, because we take care of our own. If there's a need, we take care of our own. We really try to do our best to make sure our community is well taken care of. And this one particular guy, he had told me, this was years ago, I've got a lot more help and a lot more wisdom, okay, when I tell you this story. But I just had a heart to really be a blessing. And he said that he couldn't make his car payment. So I can't make my car payment. And 
And I, I began to pray, and I thought, man, I'm, I'm going to help this guy. We're going to help him. And we believed God, and we, we sent him enough for two car payments. Praise God, right? To get him going, get him ahead, get him going on. Well, then he told me uh, a week or so later that the, the repo man came to get the car. Now, I don't know if you guys have had any experience with the repo man. I, I, thank God I never have, but I've seen people have experience with the repo man. If the repo man's coming to get your car, he's coming to get your car. He's not coming to talk about it, not coming to negotiate. He's not coming to simply, you know, just sit down and have dinner with you. No, the repo man's coming to get the car. And he said the repo man came. And I thought, man, if the repo man came, um, why did they not leave with the car? He said, well, I had, uh, I had to give him, you know, $5,000. I said, wow, what? I thought you didn't have any money. He said, I had $5,000 in, in my savings account. He said, and, uh, and so I had to give him that. I said, wait a minute, you told me you didn't have any money. We helped you to get caught up. And he said, well, that's in my savings account. <laughs> I said, man, I said, that money in that savings account was supposed to save your car. He said, no, that money was for something else. I was ready to fight. <laughs> this man took full advantage of me. And I remember going to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm going to knock him out. I'm going to fight him. I'm gonna, I got something for him. And the Lord said to me, this is when I heard the phrase, factor in that when you want to be kind, someone will take advantage of you. Now, going forward, I have tons of checks and balances that I have. One of the questions I ask people if they need financial support is, how much do you have in savings? I have to ask that now because people don't view that their checking and their savings is actually one thing. And so in that time, I I had to learn. I, I wanted to be kind. I'm overflowing in love, and I had to factor in. He took advantage of me. But I endeavor to be kind. Come on, somebody say, I'm overflowing. I'm overflowing. Paul tells us here that we will overflow with love. In Romans 15, chapter 13, in the New Living Translation, Romans 15, chapter, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Paul tells us here, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace. Because you trust in him, then you will overflow. Somebody say it loud. With confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice he wants us to be filled with joy and peace and to overflow with hope. That means we're to have more and more hope that we are to bubble over in hope and earnest expectation of something good to happen to us. We're to have abundance of hope and to have an overflow of hope. Somebody say, I'm overflowing. overflowing. A couple of uh, weeks ago, someone in our church, I won't say his name, he, he, he left. We were here at church. He left and then he came back and he brought us a box of donuts, Krispy Kreme donuts. It was awesome. And my kids, they love Krispy Kreme donuts. I, I can't lie. I like Krispy Kreme donuts, too. And so I said, thank you, man. Thank you for the donuts. My kids got excited because they were just talking about donuts, you know, to themselves. We want some donuts, so we ate some donuts. Well, then a few hours later, one of Stacy's relatives came by the house. And guess what she walked in with? A box of Krispy Kreme donuts. And she saw the box there. She was like, I was trying to be generous and nice to bring some donuts. And I said, you know what? We're overflowing. Come on, somebody. And Krispy Kreme donuts. Amen. Somebody say, I overflow. We didn't ask for any donuts, but God overflowed us with Krispy Kreme donuts. Come on, somebody say, overflow. If you begin to recognize and look, you'll see that God is overflowing in your life. The problem is we're too often looking at certain areas of our life that have a deficit. And we forget to look at the areas of life that God is overflowing in our life. And if we'll trust God, the areas where we feel like we have a deficit, he'll begin to overflow in that area too. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. John chapter 15, verse 11. John chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will 
listen, God wants us overflowing with joy. So not just overflowing in hope and not just overflowing in love, but he wants us overflowing in joy. What are you excited about? What are you looking forward to? I like to ask people these questions. What are you excited about? Because that tells me, are you expecting something good from God? What are you excited about? If you say, I'm not excited about anything. That tells me you're not overflowing in joy. What are you looking forward to? You need to get excited about it and overflow in whatever it is that you're looking forward to. And it could just be looking forward to going home and taking a nap. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. Glory to God. Sadness is the opposite of joy. Sadness is the opposite. So you're either going to be overflowing in joy with the mindset of joy is I've got, I'm cheerful and I'm in good spirits and, and I'm glad and, and I'm excited. Or you're going to be sad and you're going to respond with sadness and, and, and you're going to be down and you're going to uh, have a frown and, and everybody's going to know that, that you're sad. But joy is contagious. And if you're full of joy and you're overflowing with joy, you can snatch somebody right out of sadness. If you're overflowing with the joy of the Lord. And guess what? If you don't rejoice, the devil thinks he's winning. Are you listening to me? If you don't rejoice, the devil thinks he's winning. So we are to overflow in joy. We are to, we're to be excited, excited about something. Start thinking about the overflow. The, oh, somebody say overflow. overflow. The overflow that God wants to happen in your life. I keep hearing it in my heart, and I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it because I hear it in my heart. Brad, you told me something before service. Let God overflow with you with that. That's not too much for you. That's not too much for you. You can own that. Overflow. And when you operate in overflow, it can be yours. And then you can have it and you can say, everybody come over the house. Brad told me something that that was a little expensive. I said, guess what? Now I'm telling you, you can invite everybody over your house and serve whatever you want to serve in the overflow. Amen. Amen. Somebody say overflow. overflow. I'll tell this story real quick because I, I was going to wait till later, but I, I feel the unction to tell it now. I... I went out to eat with a guy. This guy is a, is a millionaire. He's got a lot of money. All right. I went out to eat with him, and it, we were in another state. We went to this restaurant, and he said, you know, he calls me Pastor D or, or D or whatever. He said, Pastor D, D, he said, what do, you, what do you want as an appetizer? Now, when I take my family out to a restaurant, we normally don't get appetizers. You know, we just kind of skip, get the bread, you know, get the main meal. Nothing wrong. That's kind of what we do. And, and we, normally, uh, uh, we normally skip a dessert, you know, and, and, and keep it moving. Um, so he's like, what do you want the appetizer? And, and I looked and, and I, said, I said, man, they, they look good. So the waitress comes up. He says, I want one of all the appetizers. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so then we get to the, you know, we, we eat a little bit of each of the appetizers, and uh, it was another guy with us as well. It was three of us. And then the entree, he goes, he goes Pastor D, get you a steak. I said, I don't really want a steak today. I want, I want, it, I want it fish. I said, I want a little salmon. And then so he's looking. He says, um, um, my, my guy right here, he wants steak and salmon. So, so bring him steak and salmon. And then, and then he ordered, and, and so I'm like, Okay, okay. I don't, I don't know if I have the bandwidth to eat steak and salmon. So we did. Then we get to the dessert. He's like, "You want dessert?" And I'm, at this point, I'm, I'm stuffed. I said, "I don't." He said, "Give us one of every dessert." So now the table, right? We got this. Table. It is full of food. I mean, it's full. And then we, we get done. I mean, we didn't even barely put a dent in the food. We might have ate barely half of all the food on the table. So we get up, he gets up, he, he, he pays for it, everything, you know, and he walks off and, and I struggled. I turned back and looked at that table. I said, look at all that food. Man, that feels like a waste. 
we just wasted all that food. And then I, I walked, and I end up, we end up talking, and, and I didn't say anything to him about it. I, I, get, I get going, actually, I was headed to a plane. I, and I get, went to the airport, and I went, went to my gate, went to the plane. And I said, Lord, I'm struggling. We left so much food on that table. Just feels like a waste. I'm struggling around this. And I heard the Lord speak to my heart. He said, what do you care? I heard that in my heart. I said, well, we left a lot of food. He said, did you order the food? I said, well, no. He said, did you pay for the food? I said, well, no. He said, why do you care? And I said, well, why do I care? And then I started thinking about when the poor woman poured the oil on Jesus' feet. Do y'all remember what what Judas said? Judas said, why waste? He called overflow waste. And the Lord told me, I told him to do that because I wanted you to taste everything on that menu. I heard that in my heart. I told him to order all that food because I wanted you to taste. He wanted me to experience overflow. Overflow. We start seeing overflow like it's waste. And God doesn't waste anything. And when the Lord spoke to that to me on the airplane, I came home and I told my wife, I said, I was struggling leaving all that on the table because it felt like waste, but I experienced overflow. I would have not done that on my own. I would not have ordered all that food on my own. God knew that. He said, I want you to taste everything on this menu because I want you to experience overflow. Come on, somebody say overflow. Overflow. One particular time, we were, um, we were, it was, it was our second year in ministry and our church was not doing well financially. And it was tight. It was real tight. And we were believing God, you know, and I didn't bring it to the people because the responsibility is on the Lord to cover those needs. You're going you're gonna to have to start seeing that. And don't, don't, don't look at people as your source. Well, if my grandma would give me that inheritance, that, that ain't none of your business. You focus on God. And we were, we were uh, it was tight. And I didn't tell anybody that. I kept preaching the word, but I, I had the word in God's face. God... You called this ministry to start. You told us to do this. These are your bills. You're going to have to pay for this bill. And a man who doesn't go to our church, uh, he was a friend of mine. He knew nothing about this. He said, how much is the rent on your facility? I told him how much it was. He said, the Lord told me to send that check, send you a check to cover the rent on the facility. Well, we needed that. I mean, that was a need that we had at the time. I said, glory to God. I remember running in the Stacy's closet and we did a little dance in the closet. We were so excited because the Lord came through. But this is what he said. He said, the Lord told me to tell you, I want you to experience not having to make a payment on the building this month. I said, glory to God. And then he said, I want you to experience overflow. I said, hallelujah. Overflow. Somebody say overflow. overflow. God wants you to experience the overflow. Stop looking at overflow as its waste. Well, I don't need all that. No, you don't need all that. That's why you're going to give some of it away because you don't need it all. I thought I'd get a better amen to that. Amen. Psalm 65, 11. Psalm 65, 11. You crown the year with the bountiful harvest. Even the hard pathways. Overflow. Say it louder. Overflow. With abundance. Look at this. The hard pathways are the difficult ways of life. Overflow with abundance. God provides abundance, excess, overflow, and surplus, particularly when you are in a difficult season. Think about this. You, when you're in a difficult season, stop looking at the deficit and the lack and start looking at you have access to excess. If you need wisdom, I have access to excess. I have access to more wisdom. You need strength, I have access to his excess. You need love, joy, peace, or you need some money. I have access to his excess. Glory to God. And God wants you 
to experience overflow even during difficult seasons. Somebody say amen. amen. Psalms 23, 5. Psalms 23, 5 in the King James. Watch this. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. I mean, if your cup is running over, that means you are experiencing overflow. <laughs> A cup that runs over means it can't hold all of what's being poured into it. And that cup is symbolic of a life, a life that is overflowing. And one of the cool things I want you to see, when you see the word runneth over, and in the King James, a lot of words have the ending of it is E-T-H, and that means continues to. So my cup continues to run over. Somebody say, my cup cup continues to to run over. over. That means your life, you're experiencing a life of overflow. Your cup is running over and you are experiencing more vitality, more purpose, more energy, more mission, more direction, more finances, more strength more knowledge, more understanding, more peace. You are experiencing all of this in an overflow portion. If you receive, they say, it's mine. It's mine. I'm telling you, when you start thinking overflow, I've been over the last couple of weeks embracing overflow, considering overflow. I'm done thinking about how we're going to take care of this and how we're going to take care of that. I'm now thinking about how I'm going to handle the overflow. What I'm going to do when more is coming in. Start thinking about not, well, how are we going to pay that bill? I'm thinking about paying somebody else's bill now. And when you get your mind off yourself, God said he's going to supply your need. That's the bare minimum, that that he will take care of you. Now, Now, set yourself to experience You helping take care of somebody else. That God uses you because you've got abundance and overflow that then you'll be able to help the next person. Um, I I told y'all about the time. I just feel led to tell the story again. I was talking to the Jackson family and they just, these stories are coming back before service. But I'm, I'm thinking about when... I was believing God. You guys know this story well, those who are with me. I, I had seen private planes, and I said, I want to fly in a private plane. I, I've been in those little planes, like the, you know, the, I want to get in a jet, okay? I want to fly in a luxury plane. And I said, you know what? One day, I'm going to fly in a private plane. And I remember I was sitting at the airport, getting ready to hop on a commercial airline, and the terminal was so packed. I mean, we were all on top of each other in this term. And I thought, I'm going to fly private one day. One day, I'm just going to go right into my private plane. Now, some of y'all get nervous with me even talking about this. But I, I've got an overflow mindset. I want to, if the heathen can fly in a private plane, why can't a believer? I was, amen. amen. And so I said, I'm going to do it one day. And y'all know the story. I got a call from a, from, from a friend. He said, hey, I'm in town. And, and this particular guy is, is somewhat of a celebrity. He said, I'm in town and I've got to do some work in Raleigh. Why don't you come with me? And I said, okay. He said, come by my hotel and we're going to spend the night in Raleigh and uh, we'll come back tomorrow. I, I talked to Stacey. He said, like, yeah, you got to go. Go ahead and go. And so I'm thinking, we driving to Raleigh. And he said, be there at four? I'm like, man, that's the, the toughest time to get down there to Raleigh. I get to his hotel and he's moving slow. I'm like, man, we, we got a little drive. We got, you got to pick up, pick up the pace. And I didn't say nothing to him. I had my backpack and my bag and, and we go and, and next thing I know, we hop in this, you know, this black Yukon. I'm thinking, oh, we getting, we're going to Raleigh in style. Okay, that's nice. Instead, instead, we headed to the airport. I said, hey, man, this, we're going to the airport. He goes, yeah, we're flying. I said, man, you didn't, you didn't get any of my information. Like, how did we get, get you, how'd you get me a ticket? He said, man, we're flying private. I said, oh, my gosh. I said, that's overflow. I had no idea. So we jumped on this 
this nice private airplane and, and flew down there and spent the night. And, and then, you know, he got me a nice hotel room and we went to a, a game and we just had a good time. He had some work to do and, and we just hung out. And then the next day, uh, a friend of mine on, on the next day. So when you go private, right, you, when you go commercial, you got to check your bag and all that stuff. When you go private, you, you ain't worried about checking no bag. So I come with a backpack, a friend of mine that lives down there, he's probably watching today, he follows us, our ministry as well. He said, I got some tennis shoes. He said, what size you wear? And I told him the size, he goes, oh, they're too small. I said, well, I got a son. And he's like, oh, okay. And he showed me the tennis shoes and they were the same size as Zavin's foot. And he said, matter of fact, I got a bunch of stuff to give Zavin. Just give him all this stuff. So and if you know you fly commercial, you got to check all this stuff in and I, Man, I I walked on that plane with boxes of stuff and a backpack. I said, this is overflow right here. Overflow. God wants to overflow your life in every area of your life. I'm believing for the day. Glory to God. Can I just speak some faith to you that I have my own plan? Hallelujah. And if the Lord said go. I get to go, hallelujah. And if he said, take you with me, y'all come on. And we going too, amen. Overflow. Hallelujah. Now, I know this is too much. Some of y'all get nervous. I know it's too much, but I'm tapping into the overflow. There's more in store for you and I, and we've settled for just enough. And some of us have gotten comfortable in being in bondage and gotten comfortable making payments and being in debt. And, and the first place we go look is we go to the bank. And, and listen, I don't believe that debt is a sin. I believe not being able to pay your debt is a sin. But I don't believe debt is a sin. But let's start thinking a little higher. You know, it's possible to buy something with cash. That's possible. You can do it. It's possible to buy cars with cash. Amen. Amen. It's possible to buy things with cash and start thinking about the overflow. I was thinking about the story with Joseph. Do you guys know the story? One of, one of the best stories in the Bible, I believe, at the end of Genesis, I believe it's 37 through like to the rest of the chapter. Uh, when we've been reading in Genesis, now we're in Exodus in our daily Bible reading. But the story of Joseph always amazes me because Pharaoh had a dream. Joseph's here in prison. Pharaoh has a dream. None of his magicians could tell the dream to Pharaoh. And so one guy, the cupbearer or the, or the candlestick maker or one of the guys, baker, whatever, candlestick maker, one of the guys says, listen, I was in prison. I had a dream. Joseph, this man interpreted it my dream. I bet you he can interpret your dream. And so he brings him up and he says, Pharaoh says to him, after Joseph gets cleaned up, Pharaoh says to him, "Um, I hear you can interpret dreams. Joseph said, I can't do it, but my God can. And he begins to tell him the dream and the interpretation of the dream. Pharaoh tells Joseph the dream. Joseph gives the interpretation of the dream. And part of the dream was that for seven years, there's going to be plentiful. But after those seven years, the next seven years, it's going to be so bad. A famine is going to hit the earth so bad that it's going to be worse than the prosperity that took place. And so Joseph said, okay, we need to save one fifth of the grain and everybody needs to bring a fifth of their grain and we're going to save it and we're going to store it and we're going to house it. And because Joseph was in charge, Pharaoh put him in that moment because he had the answer in that moment, he became number two in command straight from the prison to number two in command. God can do that for you. That sounds like overflow to me. Straight from the prison to number two in command. And then Pharaoh begins to save. I'm sorry, Joseph begins to save all of the grain. And he begins to store it and store it and store it. So for seven years, they became wealthy and he stored the grain. But the prophecy and the interpretation of the dream was that the famine would be worse than the prosperity. But we notice in the seven years of famine, we noticed that People were coming to Egypt and he was selling grain to the people that need it. And they kept coming and people are now at this point are selling their bodies. They've already given all of their stuff. Now they're selling their bodies and saying, hey, I need grain. I need grain. I need grain. And this always bothered me. Y'all, y'all getting into the mind of Pastor Devon right now. This always bothered me because the famine was supposed to be worse 
than the prosperity. How did Joseph continue to have grain? At some point, if the famine is worse, then the prosperity would be how were the bins still producing grain? And the Lord spoke to me just in studying this, praying about it. The Lord said those grains were overflowing. Now watch this. And this is what the Lord told me. And I have a prophetic word for you. Are you ready to hear this prophetic word? Are you ready? Yes. Get your heart ready. This is what the Lord's told me to tell you. The prophetic word he told me to tell you is you will never run out. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Get excited about that. Those bins never ran out and they never were going to run out because the favor of God was on Joseph and he was operating in overflow. They would have never ran out of grain. And the Lord told me to tell you, you are operating in overflow and you will never run out. Come on, somebody say amen. Say, I received that. Say, it's mine. I know the enemy is, is causing you to think you're about to run out. I know the enemy is causing you to think, uh, if you know, when you pay your bills, you're about to run out of money. You're about to run out of patience. You're about to run out of joy. You're about to run out of kindness. You're about to run out of health. You're about to run out of wisdom. You will never run out. Glory to God. I'm telling you, I'm so excited about this that I am expecting to run over. The same energy it takes to consider running out is the same energy you can take to consider running over. The same time it takes to worry about something that may never take place, you can take that same energy and thank God for it running over in your life. I have more than enough. I have abundance. I have surplus. I have overflow. Say it with me. Don't just let me say it. You say it with me. I have abundance. I have overflow. I have more than enough to meet every need. In Jesus' name, you will not run out. Say, I'm running over. Glory to God. Say it again. I'm running over. Say it one more time. I'm running over. In Proverbs chapter 3, then what do I do with the extra? If I'll never run out, Joseph, was, Joseph wasn't concerned about running out. He knew that those bins were overflowing. I believe supernaturally every night God was putting grain in those bins. Do you believe that? In the natural, the math doesn't work. But he's running over in Jesus' name. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will with new wine. Glory to God. Listen, what do I do? Then I'm going to honor the Lord. Joseph honored the Lord. He honored the Lord and the barns kept filling with plenty. And the vats begin to overflow with new wine. Let's look at Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Notice how it's measured. It's measured on how you use it. The way you give is the way it will be given back to you. So it's not uh, simply about amount. It's about percentage. Now, listen to me. When we're giving uh, to, to you, a thousand dollars may not be a lot to the next person. It may be a whole lot. A hundred dollars may not be a lot to you, but to the next person, it's a whole lot. God's measuring it on how you give it. And he's going to give it back to you. Scripture here says that it will be running over. Hallelujah. Running over in Jesus name. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse two. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse two. Come on up here, Sierra. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse two in the New Living Translation. It says they are being tested by many troubles, 
and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. Watch this. This group of people Paul's describing is poor, but they were filled with overflow of generosity. What do you do with the extra? Say this out to me. What do I do with the extra? You give it away. And when you give it away, God will begin to give it back to you. And he'll give it back to you and you'll be running over and you'll have more to give away and he'll give it back to you. This is what we call overflow. If you receive this word, stand to your feet. This is how you experience true life. You will never run out. I'm so glad that you spent some time with me today. I'm Pastor Devon Alexander of True Life Fellowship Church. And I look forward to spending time with you again. God bless you. Bye-bye.